in History Network show. It is Monday, March 14th, 2022, and we are live broadcasting right here on 9 10 a.m. the Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep, and you know, we're celebrating our 12th year anniversary of me broadcasting the African History Network show. First aired March 10th, 2010, March 10th, 2020, 10 years ago, even before um i came to 9 10 a.m superstation i was doing the african history network show so uh on today's show uh i, I saw this story from um march 13th uh madam nor uh had this uh had this story and then also the griot.com as well we posted it on our facebook fan page the african history network and this deals with um emmett teal and relaunching an investigation into his murder okay and the uh family of emmett teal wants the state of mississippi uh to launch a uh investigation to re-examine carolyn bryant's involvement in the 1955 murder case now we know carolyn bryant um was the was the wife of, of roy bryant and uh, Roy Bryant and his uh, brother-in-law, J.W. Millam, um, were the two men who admitted in a Look Magazine interview in killing uh, Emmett Till, all right? So we know that um, last week we talked about the Emmett Till anti-lynching bill uh, passing the, uh, 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 being passing the House and passing the Senate and being signed into law, all right? And it's uh, going to Joe Biden's desk to be signed into law. Well, you have um, his uh, his family members who want Mrs. the state of Mississippi to re-examine the case and any culpability of uh, Carolyn Bryant. OK, so we're going to talk about this, who, who's now remarried in Carolyn Bryant Dunham. She's uh, still alive. Now, you remember um, you remember back um a few months ago the department of justice back to actually december uh december 2021 the department of justice closed the uh their investigation that they reopened into uh his murder to determine if any charges could be brought against anyone including uh carolyn bryant and we talked about that here on this show but not only that, we actually walked you through the 16-page uh, report that the Department of Justice uh, released, which was their, their investigation into new allegations. Okay, so we talked about that here on this show as well. And we'll revisit that uh, today. I'm going to let you hear from uh, WAPT out of uh, Chicago, out of uh, Jackson, Mississippi, WAPT out of Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, covered a rally that Emmett Till's family had uh, back around March 11th, 2022. And they're calling for the uh, state of Mississippi to uh, launch an investigation. Emmett Till family members are holding a news conference in Jackson, Mississippi for the 14 year old who was kidnapped, um, kidnapped, uh, tortured and lynched in money mississippi in 1955 and i'm going to pull this piece up here from wapt uh in uh jackson mississippi after the briefing the family uh delivered a petition of more than 300,000 uh signatures to mississippi authorities the petition demands truth justice and accountability for Emmett Till's death. The petition demands truth, justice, and accountability for uh, Emmett Till's death. All right, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this uh, as well, this new push to get the state of Mississippi to uh, investigate and see, and, and they want specifically, they want uh, the state of Mississippi to examine uh, Carolyn Bryant Dunham's involvement in uh, Emmett Till's murder, okay? Uh, so we'll talk about that. Then uh, yesterday on, on our Sunday show, at the end of the show, uh, we talked uh, a little bit about this story 
uh, BBC has a story on this and there was a segment on uh, the black news channel. Okay. Charles Blow show on the black news channel. And it dealt with um, how the uh, Ukraine Russia crisis is affecting African countries, how the Ukraine Russia crisis is affecting African countries. Okay. So we're going to go back in and, uh, go back to that segment again and and deal with it is in its entirety we ran out of time on our on our sunday show uh dealing with this and one of the things that comes up in this discussion and tiffany cross on the cross connection on msnbc did a really good segment dealing with this is the disparate coverage when it comes to african nations that have coups when it comes to Africans that have a humanitarian crisis, a, a humanitarian crisis, it gets very little coverage in uh, mainstream media. OK, it gets very little coverage in mainstream media. There have been 16 coups. I mean, sorry, there have been six coups in about 18 months uh, in, in, in different in, in six different African countries. Very little coverage in mainstream, especially cable news. The Black News Channel will cover it. Some, especially Mark, um, Dr. Mark Lamont Hill on his show. Uh, Roland Martin will deal with it a uh, little bit as well. Uh, Roland has less resources. Uh, but when you look at MSNBC, CNN Africa, their website, CNN Africa, they'll have articles about it. But when we talk about actual coverage on cable news, gets very little coverage. Uh, in Ethiopia, the last 16 months have been hell. The north of the country, as a result of a conflict in Tigray, uh, more than two million people have been forced from their homes. And when I when I watch MSNBC, and I usually have it on all day, I flip between MSNBC and the Black News Channel. Right, MSNBC they have coverage around the clock on Ukraine, and not only that, now they've picked up Sky News. Uh, overnight, two, two, three, two a.m. to like four a.m. Sky News. So you're getting British, you're getting uh, news from uh from Britain, okay, and they're covering Ukraine. They are like that's the only story. But when it comes to uh tragedies and conflicts and wars in African nations, it gets very, very little coverage. So we'll talk about that as well. And then we are um celebrating our 12th anniversary of me broadcasting the African History Network show. Uh, now, also, uh, Shakita, our board op, she's celebrating her birthday as well. OK, so <laughs> hopefully so she turned 26. Hopefully she doesn't mind me saying that because she has it on a Facebook page. So it's public knowledge. But happy birthday, Shakita, as well. Thanks for all that you do. Um, but we're celebrating our 12th year anniversary. Let me broadcast the African History Network show. First broadcast in March 10th, 2010. So I've been doing this 12 years, six years here on 9, 10 a.m. the Superstation WFDF. So April of 2022 to actually be officially six years of me broadcasting the African History Network show uh, here, but 12 years in total, okay? All right, now on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. Uh, we have a new online class starting up. It's a new two-week online class, two consecutive Saturdays, Saturday, uh, March 19th, and Saturday, March 26th, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We know March is Women's History Month. Uh, this presentation, this uh, online class that I'm doing is Great African Women in History, the Mothers of Civilization. Great African Women in History, the Mothers of Civilization. We'll deal with profiles of over 100 African women throughout history from antiquity to uh, African deities to those in science, politics, civil rights movement, liberation movements, um, the arts, sports, etc. Okay, so this is uh, twenty-five dollars. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. Visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can register for. Great African Women in History, The Mothers of Civilization, Saturday, March 19th, Saturday, March 26th, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, even after the class is over, if you still have full access, you can watch the class even a year from now. All right, we're coming up on a break. You listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotep. We'll be back in a few minutes. Okay, stand by, everybody. Here, I'm going to post a link here. 
you can register for a new online class to start so we have some bonus content there so as soon as you register you can start watching the bonus content this is great african women in history the mothers of civilization all right kenya yeah i enrolled you in the class uh last night kenya okay stand by back from break in four minutes so there's bonus content you get uh class number one of ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa class number one are from the civil war to the civil rights movement and black power 1865 1968 that's a bonus and there's some other uh, a couple other bonus uh presentations you get as well when you register for that class so as soon as you register you can start watching the content all right stand by from breaking two minutes Stand by. In the African History Network show, we deal with current events of history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Unfortunately, many people confuse what racism is. Racism is a power structure. It was laws and policies that put us in this predicament. It's going to be laws and policies that take us out. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you can control the compass of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. We have it all on 910 AM Superstation. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM Superstation, the future radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Monday, March 14th, 2022, and we are live. All right, calling numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call-in number if you have a question or comment. Okay, so um, right before the break, I was talking briefly about uh this new push from uh emmett till's family to get the state of mississippi to um reopen to to re-examine culpability by carolyn uh bryant dunham okay and if we go to this here we're going to clip number one here in just a second shakita from wapt uh, tv um the relatives of emmett till are demanding for authorities to prosecute the white woman who was responsible for the 14 year old's tragic lynching in 1955. Uh, according to uh, AP News, Associated Press, according to uh, the Associated Press, Carolyn Bryant Dunham, who claimed uh, Emmett Till whistled, whistled at her outside of a convenience store where she worked in Money, Mississippi, uh, is still living. The 80 year old now lives in North Carolina, but Deborah Watts, a cousin 
of Emmett Till fears that time is running out uh, to bring Carolyn Bryant Dunham justice. Now, uh, uh, Car uh, Deborah Watts said, time is not on our side. She said this during a press conference at the Mississippi Capitol, uh, Jackson, Mississippi, uh, Mississippi State Capitol on March 11th, 2022. She said, time is not on our side. Uh, now, during the conference, Emmett Till's relatives were joined by uh, joined by 250,000 people as they confronted Mississippi's authorities with a petition, okay, with a petition to reopen the historic case. Um, Deborah Watts, Emmett Till's cousin, said, we demand that the state of Mississippi hold Kellen Bryant Dunham accountable uh, for her role in the kidnapping, for her role in the kidnapping uh, and lynching of Emmett Lewis Teal. Hold on just a second here. Okay. For her role in kidnapping in the lynching of uh, Emmett Lewis Teal. And my volume just went out. Hold on just a second. What is this? All right. Uh, you all should still be able to hear me on Facebook, hopefully. Okay. All right. So just a second here. All right. I, I want to go to this clip here from, um, I want to go to this clip here from, um, WAPT TV. This is what happened, um, at the. Uh, press conference. Let's go to uh, let's go to uh, clip number one, Shakita. Open for decades. Emmett Louise Till was only 14 years old when he was mutilated in Mooney, Mississippi. It's been 67 years, and the case remains unsolved. <laughs> yes! Now the family wants to see the woman they believe caused his death be charged. We say, state of Mississippi and authority, charge Carolyn Bryant Dunham now. And his cousin and co-founder of Emmett Till Justice for Family Foundation says Dunham was one of the reasons they have been fighting for years to keep the investigation active. This case and the reason why we're here today, there's a reason why Carolyn Bryant is not held accountable for Emmett Till. State representative and ambassador of Emmett Till Legacy Foundation to keep their stance has supported the family's efforts and encourages others to do the same. Stand in the fight to continue to seek justice and bring the proper accountability for folks that you can't get away with murder. Other descendants of civil rights activists stood in solidarity with Emmett's family, including the daughter of Medgar Evers and Marley Evers Williams and son of Warless Jackson. I applaud all of you. We about love. Love demands justice. Justice do up. The news conference followed a meeting with federal and state officials. And after the family delivered a petition with over 300,000 signatures to Mississippi authorities. I'm holding the petition right now in my hand, and it has three major demands. The first, that anybody or any suspects involved in the case are brought to justice. The next, that Carolyn Bryant Donham is immediately charged. And last, that an official apology is sent to the Till family from the federal government, Department of Justice, and the state itself. Live inside the Capitol, Grayson Gordon, 16 WAPT News. Okay. All right. Thank you, Shakita. OK, so that's w, that's from WAPT News in um, Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, check out the article from March 11th, 2022. Emmett Till's family seeks justice for 1955 killing. Emmett Till's family seeks justice for 1955 uh, killing. All right. I want to go back to the uh, article here from Madam Noor uh, for just a second. Then we're going to clip to Shakita from uh, the Black News Channel. So uh, Deborah Watts said, we demand that the uh, state of Mississippi hold Carolyn 
Carolyn Bryant Dunham accountable for her role in the kidnapping and lynching of Emmett Lewis Teal. It is important for us to know that Emmett's murder remains unsolved and that the last living accomplice in the murder case is Carolyn Bryant. And yes, she is alive. She denies that she recanted her story that Emmett made sexual advances toward her and her family stands by the lie that she told in 1955, she lied that Emmett died. Now, we went through this thoroughly back in December of 2021, when the news came out around December 6, 2021, that the Department of Justice had dropped, uh, the Department of Justice closed their investigation into the murder of Emmett Lewis Teal, and they were trying to find new evidence. They were following the leads from um, Professor Timothy Tyson's book um, that came out in 2017, uh, The Blood of Emmett Teal. And back in December 2021, right around December 6th, December 7th, I took you through the 16 page Department of Justice uh report that came out that breaks down their investigation and breaks down them following these new leads and they kept running into dead ends so hopefully the state of mississippi can find new evidence i'm not sure what the new evidence is going to be we know that the we know that the statute of limitations on perjury charges perjuring yourself in in court is five to seven years depending upon the state this trial of jw millam and roy bryant was in 1955 statute of limitations ran out decades ago so even if she even if she is lying you have to find evidence you have to be able to provide evidence that she is lying and evidence that will hold up in court especially against cross-examination by her defense attorneys so hopefully they do find evidence. I just don't know what that evidence is going to be because it's been so many years and all the witnesses have died. So if we look at this very quickly here, we're coming up on a break. Just as the department closes Emmett Till investigation without charges, the department said it could not corroborate a book's claim. It didn't say a book's evidence. It said a book's claim that a central witness had recanted her statements about Emmett, Emmett Till OK, the Justice Department announced on Monday in, in December 2021 that it had closed an investigation into the abduction of Emmett Till um, in a news in a news release dated December 6, 2021. Federal officials said there was not enough evidence to pursue charges in the case. It's not enough to say she lied. You have to be able to provide evidence that she lied not in court in 1955 because the statute of limitations ran out on perjury you have to have evidence that she was actually involved in his murder like like evidence okay now i don't know what the evidence is going to be because it's been so long and the witnesses have died uh and then the investigation that was opened in 2007 to look to look into the case again, the statute of limitations in line to uh, investigators, fellow investigators that ran out, this new case that they just closed in 2021, this new investigation, that they could find evidence that she lied to federal investigators within that case, within that investigation, then they could bring her up on perjury charges, but they couldn't find any evidence that she actually lied to federal investigators. So this is, even though we want her held accountable, when you go to court, this is much bigger than just saying she lied. Citing the statute of limitations in Carolyn Bryant Dunham's denial that she had ever changed her story, the Justice Department said it could not move forward with prosecuting her for, for prosecuting her for perjury because they, they didn't have any evidence that she perjured herself. 
and she maintains her story. So you have to provide evidence that she's lying. During a moment of the trial in which jurors were not present, in which juror, jurors were not present in the 1955 trial, Kellen Bryant Dunham claimed the teenager made sexually vulgar comments toward her and, and toward her and physical comment contact. But in a book published in 2017 called The Blood of Emmett Till by Professor Timothy Tyson, the author Timothy T Tyson wrote that Carolyn Bryant had recanted her testimony in a 2008 interview saying that the earlier stories she told were, quote, not true, end quote. But he couldn't provide any evidence that she recanted her testimony. We're going to continue this another side of the break and break this down. You listen to the African History Network show. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. I don't think the FBI cares about these hate crimes. The FBI investigates and prosecutes on hate crimes. The first thing people should do is read this 16 page report from the Department of Justice because I read it. It's very thorough. And the problem is, they, they all these claims. We dealt with this back in December 2021 and broke this down. Timothy Tyson didn't provide any evidence that she recanted her story. He said he said he did two audio interviews with her. He provided one. He said the second one was lost. When when it comes when it came down to him actually even stating that okay, she recanted her story. He kept going back and forth on what she actually said was false. This is why you have to do research. This is why this show is different than a lot of other nonsense floating around on social media. Who, who has shown you the Department of Justice report and take you through this report? And the, and the, and the, and the, the, the crux of this report, the most important thing, I think, based upon my research on this, and I've read the entire 16-page report, most important part is pages... Um, pages that would be five pages four and five because all the new allegations and everything they went through and investigated all that and they kept running in the dead ends so at the end of the day that the, the question okay what evidence do you have prove it you have to prove in court beyond a reasonable doubt that she lied where's your evidence you can't go in you can't go into court with beliefs because, because whoever you present, whatever evidence you present is going to get destroyed during cross-examination by her defense attorneys. So what evidence are you citing? So this is page four. Because I actually do research. This is page four. And it goes through and it breaks down Professor Timothy Tyson's claims. Now the, the now the first problem is that he did two interviews in 2008 with Carolyn Bryant Dunham a month before his book was published in 2017 called The Blood of Emmett Till then he said he had smoking gun evidence that she recanted her testimony well if you interviewed her in 2008 and you had this smoking gun evidence why the hell didn't you say something in 2008 when you interviewed her Why'd you wait till about a month before your book came out before you said something? He waited nine years before he said, if you got smoking gun information, smoking gun evidence to prove that a key witness lied in a trial in 1955, why the hell did you wait nine years? Radio. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. Now, during break, I just kept going because I'm talking to the people on Facebook and YouTube. We, I just kept going. I ain't stopped. Okay. So let's, let's pick this up. Let's review this. We're going to clip two from the Black News Channel in just a second, Shakita. But let's see. One of the problems is here is that we have to separate emotionalism from facts and like logic. Those are two different things. Okay. I'm a very logical, methodical person. I deal with facts and evidence. I've read through this 16 page report. Who's taking you through this before besides me? All those watching on Facebook and YouTube. Who's taking you through? This is the this is the report from the Department of Justice 
that deals with the investing. This is at the Department of Justice website, justice.gov. Emmett Teal, notice to close file. This is the 16 page report that lays out the investigation that they did and all the new all the new claims. They went and investigated all that stuff and they kept running in the dead ends. Now, hopefully, the state of Mississippi comes up with some new evidence. Hopefully they can finally get some justice for Emmett Till. I'm not sure what evidence they're going to come up with because all the witnesses have died. The only the only witness that's still alive besides Carolyn Bryant was outside of the store uh, when Emmett Till had the interaction with Carolyn Bryant and he he didn't hear what happened. Now, maybe they'll come up with some new evidence. Hopefully they do. I'm not sure what it's going to be. But if we go back to um, this right here, now those watching on Facebook and YouTube, I'm still waiting for you to tell me who's walked you through this report from the Department of Justice. See, we deal with real, we deal with real research here. We deal with facts and evidence. I don't, I don't, I don't deal with emotionalism and try to hype people up on nonsense. Okay, so when this story came out, once again, I've been doing radio twelve years. When the, when the story came out in 2017 that Timothy Tyson did this interview in 2008 with Carolyn Bryant Dunham and has new smoking gun evidence, all this. We covered it here on this show in 2017. Because I was on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation then. And I was going through reading over and over and over again what he was claiming was smoking gun evidence. And even though we, we talked about it here on the show, I was still skeptical because I'm like, okay, well, what did she recant? Because it was it was vague based upon his description, Professor Timothy Tyson, about exactly what she recanted. But in a book published in 2017, The Blood of Emmett Till by Timothy Tyson, Professor Timothy Tyson, the author wrote that Carolyn Bryant Dunham had recanted her testimony in a 2008 interview that he did. He did two interviews with her, two audio recordings, two audio interviews with her in 2008. He said that, he, and he said that the earlier stories she told, quote unquote, were not true. What was not true? Quote, nothing that boy did could ever justify what happened to him. End quote. Tim, Professor Timothy, Timothy Tyson, a researcher and historian at Duke University, quoted Carolyn Bryant as saying in the book. OK, we know that's true. But what but what are you saying? But but what did she recant? Yeah, we know nothing that he could have done ever justify what happened to him. But what did she recant of her testimony? Professor Tyson's claim generated outrage and renewed calls for the case to be reopened. Kristen Clark, who leads the uh, African-American female, brilliant attorney, Kristen Clark, who leads the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division, delivered the news to the family in person that the case was formally closed. In a statement on Monday, the Justice Department said Professor Tyson, in a statement on Monday, in December 2021, early December 2021, the Justice Department said Professor Timothy Tyson, despite saying he recorded two interviews with Carolyn Brian Dunham, provided just one recording to the FBI that did not contain a recantation. This is why you can't just go repeating stuff that you heard. You have to go research it. What is the evidence? Because I kept in 2017 when this stuff came out, I kept reading over and over. And I'm like, OK, where is the smoking gun? What specifically addressed with specificity what you are saying she recanted? Professor Timothy Tyson said that although he did not record Carolyn Bryan Dunham's recantation, he took detailed notes. But then you but you said you got the smoking gun. See, once you get deeper and this is what the this is what the Department of Justice report does. It goes deep. The last thing you ever want to do is be investigated by the Justice Department or the FBI, because all that BS that you say, they're going to go investigate everything all the way down the rabbit hole. And that's what they did here. And when they went through, investigated all this stuff, then when you read the report, they say that Timothy Tyson kept changing his story about whether he actually recorded her recanting any testimony 
And then he kept changing the story about what happened to the lost recording. So you can't keep going in the court with what had happened was you have to have evidence because what people fail to understand and any attorney would tell you this. If she goes into court, she's going to have at least one defense attorney and they're going to shred any evidence you have or any witnesses on cross-examination. Quote, Carolyn, he said, Carolyn started spilling the beans before I got the recorder going. I documented her words carefully. Timothy Tyson said in the email on Monday morning to uh, the New York Times, adding, quote, my reporting is rock solid. She started spilling the bean. OK, so what did she say to recant the testimony? See, I've been through this frontwards and backwards. I've read through the report. This is why I'm like, OK, there's no evidence. At a news conference in Chicago on Monday afternoon, Emmett Till's family members said they were disappointed by the result of the investigation, but were not surprised. OK, now, it's understandable they're they're, you know, uh, disappointed. So if you if we go for the sake of time here, if we go and look at the actual report, page four is extremely, extremely important. Pages four and five. OK, now read the whole report. This is at justice.gov, official website of the Department of Justice. I'm going to post a link here. Right here on the thread of the broadcast. Emmett Till noticed the closed file. So when you go through and we look at page four, page four, section D, Timothy Tyson's claim that uh, Carolyn Bryant recanted her testimony. OK. Last thing you ever want, last thing you ever want to have to be investigated by the Justice Department, because they're going to go through with a fine tooth comb. And if you said that you were over here, OK, on Fifth Avenue between the hours of 5 p.m. and 6 p.m., on March 26, they either going to be able to prove it or they're going to say they can't find any evidence to prove that. Um, no additional investigative steps were, were taken by the federal or state government in the next decade. Then shortly before, let's check this out, shortly before the publication of his book, The Blood of Emmett Till, Professor Timothy Tyson, let me go. Professor Timothy Tyson revealed this year. Okay. Section D. Page four. No additional investigative steps were taken by the federal or state government in the next decade. Then shortly before the publication of his book, The Blood of Emmett Till in 2017, Professor Timothy Tyson revealed to several media outlets that they have her name x out is carolyn brian dunham had done uh, carolyn brian dunham had during an interview with him nearly a decade earlier recanted the account that she had provided under oath during a hearing at uh the the, the murder trial of emmett teal him being killed OK, Roy Bryant and and J.W. Millen were on trial. Now. Professor Timothy Tyson did two interviews with Carolyn Bryant Dunham in 2008. If you have smoking gun evidence that she recanted her testimony under oath in the 1955 trial, why did you wait nine years before you said something about it shortly before your book came out in 2017? Now, that's the first question I had. First of many questions I had. Why did you wait nine years? So, Professor Timothy, Professor Timothy Tyson's account suggested that Carolyn Bryan Dunham lied in court and lied during the FBI's 2004 investigation. And that investigation closed about 2007. OK, specifically, Professor Timothy, Timothy Tyson stated that Carolyn Bryant Dunham admitted that her representation that Emmett Till had made 
verbal and physical advances toward her in the store was quote unquote not true in the book which was published the following month the blood of Emmett Till Professor Timothy Tyson wrote that Carolyn Brian Dunham said I have thought and thought about everything about Emmett Till the killing and the trial telling who did what to who and then she murmured quote they're all dead now anyway he wrote that while quote trying hard to distinguish fact from remembrance Carolyn Bryant Dunham revealed a story different from what he thought he knew about the incident specifically he represented that Emmett Till handed him a no he, he, uh Carolyn Bryant Dunham handed him a transcript of her sworn testimony and claimed that part's not true what part's not true We'll continue this on the other side of the break because I'm still trying to figure out. You listen to the African History Network show right here on 9 10 a.m. Superstation Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. All right, stand by. All right, stand by. Back from break in four minutes. All right, share this broadcast on social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in. All right, if you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. We have six days a week. This helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting. Uh, you can register for my new online class. It's a two-week online class, two consecutive Saturdays, Saturday, March 19th, and Saturday, March 26th, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Great African Women in History, the Mothers of Civilization. Great African Women in History, the Mothers of Civilization. We're going to profile over 100 different uh, women of African descent all throughout uh, all throughout history, from antiquity, from uh, African queens, where we talk about Nefertiti, whether we talk about Queen Nzinga, Queen T, uh, whether we talk about uh, scientists like Dr. Tr uh, Patricia Bath, um, whether we talk about uh, Harriet Tubman, Angela Davis, Henrietta Lacks, um, uh, Dr. Rebecca Lee Crumpler, okay, who was the first African American woman to uh, actually become a medical doctor. Uh, this is Saturday, March 19th, Saturday, March 26th at our online school, uh, Great African Women in History, the Mothers of Civilization. We just posted the link here. It's also at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. So it's on sale. 20, it's uh, $25. And we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it any time. Stand by. Back from break in three minutes. Back from break in two minutes. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9 10 a.m. Superstation, the future radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Monday, March 14th, 2022. Be sure to uh, register for my new online class. Uh, that meets on Saturdays, March 19th and March 26th, 2022. Great African Women in History, the Mothers of Civilization. Uh, this is about a four-hour online class. It's $25. And we will profile uh, over 100 African women throughout history, uh, all different time periods from antiquity, from African queens to 
deities to freedom fighter freedom fighters whether we talk about harriet tubman whether we talk about sojourner truth yeah santi wa uh whether we talk about the uh, uh, african african-american women in politics the civil rights movement uh medicine uh science okay we'll, we'll deal with uh this is two classes two sessions we'll deal with over 100 um african women from all different time periods uh whether we talk about dr patricia bath uh, Dr. Rebecca Lee Crumpler, Henrietta Lacks, uh, Annie T. Malone, who was the mentor of Madam C.J. Walker, Queen Nzinga, Queen T, my aunt, Osset, uh, Neat. Uh, so this is a visual presentation. I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips. Uh, that's at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We'll post the link here. And then also... Uh, the classes I teach, uh, my normal classes, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. We deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. So that next class is uh, March 19th. That's 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern. We'll probably start that about 2.30 p.m. because I'm wrapping up the other class at 2 p.m. Uh, but it's normally 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. That's on sale $60, regularly $130. We deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. And then uh, on Sunday, uh, I teach from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. So those two classes you can get in the bundle pack for a hundred dollars. It's a two hundred sixty dollar value. And if you've taken any of my online classes before, email me at ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com. All right. Um, so very quickly here, I want to go back to uh this, and we're, we're gonna go to uh clip number two, uh Shakita from Black News Channel here in just a second. So if we look, uh, this is page four. The bottom of page four of uh, the Department of Justice uh, report, the 16 page investigation into the new allegations behind Emmett Till's killing. Uh, Professor Timothy Tyson said that Carolyn Bryant handed him a sheet of paper, a sworn testimony, a transcript of a sworn testimony. And he claimed she said that part's not true. What part's not true? He then wrote, if that part was not true, I asked what did happen. Quote, I want to tell you, she said, honestly, I just don't remember. What part's not true? See, when you when you keep when you go through and keep it keep going through all these allegations and go step by step by step, you keep running to a dead end. He said, she said that part's not true. What part's not true? That's your smoking gun evidence. She said, I want to tell you, honestly, I just don't remember. It was 50 years ago. You tell these stories for so long that they seem true, but that part is not true. What part's not true? Nothing that boy did could ever justify whatever happened to him. We know that. What part's not true? This is what he claimed. Look, one, one interview is missing. When you read the Department of Justice report, he kept changing the explanation of what happened to the report, that's the, the, the interview that's missing. Timothy Tyson's claim of a recantation understandably caused outrage. Okay. They go on to talk about that. Now, um, let me see. We can do page five. The current investigation was designed to identify evidence corroborating Professor Timothy Tyson's claim that Carolyn Bryant recanted her 1955 testimony and whether there was additional evidence identifying one previously unknown information of uh, someone be having been complicit in Emmett Till's death or abduction, two, any previously unknown living subject, and three, a basis to support any other federal or state charges. In reexamining these issues, the FBI interviewed Carolyn Bryant Dunham uh, Professor Timothy Tyson and persons close to or associated with them. In addition, the government also re-interviewed, I'm not sure who that is, the last this is the last surviving member of the group of young men who accompanied Emmett Till to the grocery and meat market where Carolyn Bryant was working, and who was present when Emmett Till was abducted uh, uh from his relative's home. Okay, I think that was his uh cousin. 
think that was his cousin they're talking about. The FBI also obtained and reviewed other relevant documents, conducted forensic computer analysis, and consulted with case agents familiar with the earlier investigation. The FBI quickly identified a significant obstacle in this investigation. Professor Timothy Tyson conducted two separate interviews in 2008, while he waited nine years to say something, I don't know, with Carolyn Bryan Dunham and recorded and transcribed both. However, the key statements made to him recanting her previous testimony were neither recorded nor transcribed. The, 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 however, the key statements that Carolyn Bryan Dunham reportedly made to Professor Timothy Tyson in 2008 during his two interviews that he did with her, that he claimed she recanted her, her previous testimony, that, 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 that uh, confession was neither recorded nor transcribed. The FBI learned that Professor Timothy Tyson had lost one of the recordings. The one during which Carolyn Bryan Dunham reportedly recanted her earlier statements and sworn testimony. Moreover, Professor Timothy Tyson gave inconsistent explanations of whether there had ever been a recording of the admission. And if not, why none had been made? Because I went through read all this stuff and it kept changing the explanation. It kept changing. Did you actually record her? recanting or did she spill the beans before you started recording professor timothy tyson also gave differing accounts as to when carolyn bryant made the recantation and professor timothy tyson told investigators that although carolyn bryant any part of her testimony as untrue he understood from the context of their conversation that she was for referring to her allegation that Emmett Till had, phys had physically accosted her in the store and that this connection was recorded in his written notes. So, so now you go from a smoking gun to a powder puff. You're drawing from the context. Hopefully they get justice for Emmett Till, but they ain't going to be with this stuff right here. Uh, those watching on Facebook and YouTube, uh, keep watching. We're out of time here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF. Uh, I'm going to go back to the clip uh, from uh, Black News Channel. We'll go to that, and then we'll go to this segment from uh, uh, dealing with uh, the impact of Ukraine, Russia on African countries. Right now, it's correct. Wrong behavior is not over till we win. Wakanda kind of forever. We'll talk to you next time. Peace. No, she did not confess that she lied about it. No. <laughs> go find the evidence this is why you just can't repeat headlines you got to go research this stuff you can't just repeat headlines the first question you should ask is if professor timothy tyson interviewed carolyn bryant dunham in 2008 and she made smoking gun evidence that she lied in her in her sworn testimony in a 1955 trial why did he wait nine years to say something about it he didn't say anything about it until 2017 about a month before his book came out about Emmett Till. Now that's the first question that I had. I'm like, why the hell did you wait so long? This is why you have to read past headlines. I can't stress this enough. I see so much BS I see floating around. Who has taken you through this report? Because most of these people talking don't even know this report exists. I read it. It's very thorough. When you go through, this is what I'm saying. You go through it, even in 2017, when I covered this story in 2017, I still had questions because I, I, I read everything that he, Professor Timothy Tyson put out. I didn't read his book, but all the interviews and all that stuff. And it was saying, OK, she said that part's not true. He never said what part's not true. So you can go into court with that if you want to. That's, that case going to get thrown out. Department of Justice ain't, they ain't going to do that that case is going nowhere not with that flimsy evidence um okay i want to go to this one here so 
Okay, read read uh, the article from New York Times. Justice Department closes Emmett Till investigation without charges. That's from December 6, 2021. We talked about it here on this show when, when this happened. Um, you can read this one also from WAPT, uh, Channel 16 in Jackson, Mississippi. Emmett Till's family seeks justice for 1955 killing. This is from March 11th, 2022. On uh, so we know that the Emmett Till anti-lynching bill finally passed the U.S. Senate. We talked about it here on this show, and uh, it's going to be signed into law by uh, President Joe Biden after 200 tries. Okay, the Congress has tried 200 times to get a federal anti-lynching bill passed. And it was uh, Representative Bobby Rush of uh, the Congressional Black Caucus who uh, saw this through. And I wanna pull this up uh, quick. We talked about this when this happened. Um, so if you watch this show daily, you know, you uh, probably remember us talking about this. We look at this piece here from the New York Times. House passes bill to make lynching a hate crime. OK, it passed the House and it passed the Senate also. OK, uh, lawmakers in both parties hail the action as historic but a separate bill to outlaw discrimination based on a person's nat natural hair failed amid republican opposition okay so this passed the house and it also passed the senate okay so you read this from uh new york times it's february 28th last day of african-american history month last day of black history month so on the black news channel to whitlow on the black news channel spoke with deborah watts a cousin of um emmett teal about the Emmett Till anti-lynching bill uh, uh, passing the House and the Senate and heading to uh, President Joe Biden's desk to be signed into law. Okay, uh, we'll go to that here in just a second. And it makes lynching a federal hate crime. And also, um, you don't have to, the person doesn't have to be killed uh, for it to be classified as, as a federal federal hate crime. It can be uh just uh, hurt very badly they don't have to be killed okay if we go to this article just a second then we'll go to the clip here uh the house on monday overwhelmingly approved legislation that would make um lynching a federal hate crime moving to formally outlaw a brutal act that has been a symbol a brutal act that has been a symbol of the failure by Congress and the country to reckon with the history of racial violence in America. Passage of the anti-lynching bill named in honor of Emmett Till uh, came after more than a century of failed attempts. Lawmakers estimated they had tried more than 200 times to pass a measure to explicitly criminalize a type of attack that has long terrorized African-Americans. The bill was approved 422 to three um, in the House of Representatives and uh, there's three dumbass Republicans that didn't vote for the bill. Um, so we know Bobby Rush, former member of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, he was the sponsor of the bill. And let me see. Um, okay. These are the three Republicans who voted against the bill. Representatives Andrew Clyde of Georgia, Thomas Massey, Kentucky, and Chip Roy of Texas, who, who Chip Roy of Texas said that lynching was like a form of justice. This is what he said. Okay. We talked about this uh, when this happened back um, early March. Um, in and we know that it was Senator Rand Paul who blocked the bill in June 2020. Senator Rand Paul helped write this new bill and um, they were able to get it passed. Okay, I want to go to this clip here from uh, the Black News Channel that discusses this.
blocked that bill, one of them being Congressman Andrew Clyde. Now, he agreed that lynching is an evil act of violence, but wrote in a statement, uh, simply put, we do not need another duplicate, duplicative federal law carving out a separate distinction for lynching. Let me start, um, that. Let me start that from the beginning. For what sure. is the one thing that for some reason it wasn't uh, maybe symbolic, plain. but it falsely the Republicans anti lynching hate crime. I don't know why it was Anti-lynching act. BNC Live. I'm Tishani Whitlow. We start with the image. It's finally heading to President Biden's desk for signature. The Senate unanimously approved the bill last night, officially classifying lynching as a federal hate crime. After more than 200 failed attempts to outlaw lynching, is finally succeeding in taking the long overdue action by passing the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act. Hallelujah, it's long overdue. Well, speaking of being long overdue, get this, over in the House, three Republicans voted against the legislation before it reached the Senate. Those folks are Thomas Macy of Kentucky, Chip Roy of Texas, and Andrew Clyde of Georgia. All right, joining us now to continue this conversation and discuss this historic first, we have Deborah Watts. She is the cousin of Emmett Till, and she's also the co-founder and executive director of the Emmett Till Legacy Foundation. It is a pleasure to have you. Welcome to BNC Live. Welcome back, better yet. Um, yes, thank you. Hope you can hear me. Yes, I can hear Wonderful. you. And she's thank joining you. us by phone for our folks at home watching. Why do you think it took so long, right, to pass an anti-lynching bill? You know, I, I asked that question myself. Uh, it is something that our country has been haunted with for a number of years. We have 6,500 individuals that have been lynched in our country, with 4,000 of them, over 4,000 of them being African American. And it's a stain that we have tried to recover from for years. And so I don't think it's something that we're um, happy with or something that we want as part of our American history, but it's there. And I believe there are some, some that did not want to face the fact that this horrific part of our history was something that, you know, we continue to do over the years. And so that's a, that's a great question to ask and one that we pondered, you know, for years. But now we've had finally had the courage to stand up and face what has been a horrific thing that we've done to others in our country. And now we are uh, moving forward and hopefully we'll be able to reckon with some of the, the past uh, history and also correct the right or the wrongs that have been committed against African-Americans, black and brown bodies in, in the United States. Yeah, uh, Deborah, three uh, GOP representatives, as I'm sure you're aware of, blocked that bill. One of them being Congressman Andrew Clyde. Now, he agreed that lynching is an evil act of violence, but wrote in a statement, uh, simply put, we do not need another duplicate, duplicative federal law carving out a separate distinction for lynching uh, may be symbolic, but it falsely suggests that individuals who commit or attempt to commit a already face criminal charges and consequences. Is there any truth in that? I mean, is this just symbolic? Well, at a federal level, it's necessary that we define lynching as it is and we rectify what has been on the books uh, as being a, a, a opportunity to lynch people. And we've not avoided the fact that uh, that's possible in our country. And we've had modern day lynchings that have occurred as well. And so I think it's important that we make sure that our laws reflect where we are today. And this is an opportunity to do that at a federal level and to prosecute at a federal level. And so I think this is the right thing to do. Our family has, you know, this bill is in Emmett's name. And our family, of course, is very proud to say that uh, this is moving forward and being hopefully signed by President Biden really soon. But um, I really don't focus on uh, the naysayers and those that uh, participate in objecting to something that moves our country forward. 
And if it's a duplicate, I'm sure that there are other ways and layers that we need to address as it relates to lynching and other atrocities that have happened uh, to others or to African-Americans in our country and black and brown uh, people in our country. So um, we need to make sure that we bring the full force of our constitution, the full force of our laws to prevent anything like this happening in the future. Yeah, uh, your cousin's horrific murder unfortunately wasn't the last um and to bring it full force or, or bring it forward better yet uh folks compare trayvon martin uh ahmaud aubrey uh to your cousin's killing the fact that we still yeah. had folks trying to block this on the federal level and to add insult to injury right 200 attempts to get this passed on the federal level what do you believe this says about our country better yet the state of our country still Yes, um, well, 120 years is a long time. This is long overdue. And it's time that we face some of the uh, the stain that we've left, um, the horrific nature that we've treated others in our country. And I think it says that we hopefully will be ready to move forward. There's so much more work to do as well to unravel some of the the laws that have been in place or those loopholes that are still there and also face the fact with Mamie Till Mobley, for instance, opening the casket to seeing that the monstrous ways that we've treated others, the monstrous ways that we've continued to lynch and the through line that is continuing even today, it's time. And so I think that we need to stand up, face the fact of our history. This is American history. That is something that I don't think we like and something that we need to be progressively and aggressively moving forward to right the wrongs of the past. And so this says that we're ready to move forward. And I think those activists, those family members like myself and, and those other families, the 150 or so that are on the Emmett Till, Unsolved Civil Rights Crimes Act say that this is long overdue. So they're looking for justice. We're looking for justice, truth, and accountability. And we have to also face the fact that Emmett Till's case, 67 years, close to 67 years that we're facing, that it has still not been solved. This is an open murder case. And so as we move forward with this bill and in its name, we have an opportunity to right that wrong as well bring justice, truth, and accountability, and hold the last known living accomplice charged with the uh, kidnapping and, and murder of Emmett Lewis Till. So this is a connecting point, and it should be a connecting point for our country, that when they look at Emmett's horrific face and the, the way that he was treated with a 75-pound cotton gin fan tied around his neck, thrown into the Tallahatchie River, that they will think about what this means for their children, what their mean, what it means for those in the past and the present and the future. And so we need to do whatever we can to stand up against the injustices that have been brought upon our people. All right, uh, you can listen to the rest of that at uh, the Black News Channel's YouTube channel. That is from, that's uh, Tashani Whitlow for the Black News Channel. That is from March 9th, 2022. Emmett Till anti lynching act heads to Biden's desk. And uh, in that clip, she interviewed Deborah Watts, Emmett Till's cousin and the co founder and executive director of the Emmett Till Legacy Foundation. All right. Now, uh, if we go to this piece here from the Associated Press. This article from Associated Press: Emmett Till relatives seek uh, Emmett Till relatives seek renewed probe of 55 lynching, 1955 lynching. This is from March 11th, 2022, and uh, there's a picture here of Deborah Watts. Uh, they have the credit here. Okay, but in the article, uh, there's a section where they talk about other accomplices uh, the justice department in in their investigation okay the uh, justice department found 
Carolyn Bryant Dunham, sorry, found that uh, Roy Bryant, Carolyn Bryant Dunham's ex-husband, Roy Bryant and J.W. Millam, who was his half-brother, okay, were not the only people involved, however, in estimates on the number of people who might have played a role in Emmett Till's killing range from a half dozen to more than 14. Okay, now, I think they're all dead, though. That's the problem. So it's one thing to find out exactly what happened, how many people were involved, who was involved, things like this. But if they're not alive, you can't bring them to justice. So you have two things that you want to find out, exactly what happened to Emmett Till, who was involved in this killing, one, two, is anybody still alive that can be brought to justice? So you have two things. Because as Deborah Watts said, his, his murder is still an open murder. Even though Roy Bryan and J.W. Millam, a few months after the trial in 1955 when they were acquitted, they did an interview in Look Magazine, and they admitted in that interview in Look Magazine to killing Emmett Till, and they were paid $4,000 for that interview. Now, although it's unlikely a governor would have a role in deciding uh, whether to reopen an investigation, Mississippi Governor Tate Reeves, Republican, was asked during a Friday news conference about Emmett Till's family seeking justice for the teenager's lynching. Quote, the lynching of any teenager is of significance and certainly something that we as a society should do anything in our power to make sure that we bring anyone that committed that crime or any other to justice, uh, take, uh, Governor Tate Reeves uh, said. Uh, okay, so on Monday, Congress gave final approval to the legislation, and that was uh, Monday, March 7th. Uh, final approval to the legislation that for the first time would be a federal hate crime, Lynch would be a federal, federal hate crime, sending the bill to President Joe Biden's desk. Years in the making, the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act is among some 200 bills that have been introduced over the past century that have tried to ban lynching in the U.S. And we can go back to 1917 and the um, silent parade, the silent march, 10,000 African Americans marching down uh, Fifth Avenue in Manhattan demanding a federal anti-lynching law. All right. Uh, I want to go to this story here. We we started talking about this on Sunday show. And we ran out of time. Like we ran out of time here. But uh, I'm going to go back to this clip. We're going to finish the rest of this. This dealt with um, the Russia-Ukraine conflict, how it impacts African countries. And uh, this is from uh, Charles Blow's show. Uh, Prime on uh, the Black News Channel. Every now and then he does have some good stuff. Some of the other stuff is nonsense. Like that um, misinformation he put out about HBCUs and uh, the money HBCUs were getting. Um, if you saw the segment on Roland Martin Unfiltered today when Roland dealt with the true uh, money is like $6.7 billion that HBCUs have gotten from the Biden Harris administration. It's 5.8 billion just in 2021. But we were supposed to talk about that on Friday when I was on Rolling Show. I sent him a screenshot of the BS that uh, Charles Blow was talking about on his show last last week when he dealt with HBCUs. It was some misinformation. He was he was quoting the debunked uh, story from Newsweek that conflated $45 billion originally for MSIs, conflated that with $45 billion for HBCUs. MSIs are minority, minority serving institutions. It's just a whole bunch of nonsense floating around. But anyway, um, we talked about uh, this on yesterday's show, uh, the, the uh, on our Sunday show, the, the how the Russia-Ukraine conflict impacts African countries. Okay, I want to go back to this. He's speaking with um, Dr. Imani Cheers, uh, associate professor at Georgetown, at George Washington University, 
and uh, uh, Dr. Clarence Lusain, who is a, a political science professor at Howard University. Let's go back to uh, that clip already in progress. Talked about um, the fact that with their own countries and with their own um, struggles and crises and conflicts, whether it be with inflation, whether it be with famine. In the intro, you talked about um, the the Horn of Africa and the conflicts that are um, currently exacerbated there. You talked about Kenya. We look at countries like Nigeria, South Africa, even the Democratic Republic of Congo, and it's really a strategic move. How do these governments? position themselves to make truly what can be a power play. There is clearly a humanitarian crisis occurring at the moment, but we're also talking about nations that have had humanitarian crisis, years of war and strife, and the global community have not come to their aid. So it is is truly a moment in time and a moment in history where we're seeing that these conflicts and this particular conflict with Russia and Ukraine and how it's playing on the continent and it has to be a strategic power play. Uh, Professor Lusain, you know, Russia is doing to some degree exactly what China has been doing, which is they see this enormous continent, right? <laughs> it has a lot of acreage, a lot of mineral resources. It has a lot of people who could be workers. And so China was, has been making incursions into in, and investments into the continent of Africa. Russia has been doing that to a lesser degree, but also doing it. Some people believe that, that Putin may, in fact, turn more to, to doing that more if he becomes more isolated, but also that that may be part of the reason why some of the African countries, they're getting not only food from Russia, they're also getting weapons from Russia. Yeah, so these are, yeah so these are really important points. So thank you for doing this, Brother Charles. So uh, Africa as a whole is facing a dilemma. As much as possible, it would like to act in unison uh, through some of the regional organizations, the African Union, uh, ECOWATS, the uh, Economic Community of West African States, through the uh, South African development community. Africa would understands that there are strengths in numbers, but as you pointed out in the introduction, because there are very specific relations between specific countries, uh, both with Ukraine and with Russia, it makes it extremely difficult to move and coherently uh, as a whole. So what we saw with that vote was that you had a number of countries uh, who abstained. They did not want to take sides. Uh, and the, the reason for that is the long history, is, as Professor Cheers pointed out, when you go back to the colonial and the imperial er eras and the Cold War era, Africa was caught in a, in a bind because it was either the Soviet Union or United States in the West, uh, neither of which had African interests in mind. And so being aware of that history, uh, going all the way back actually to the Berlin Conference, uh, when Africa was divided up by Europe, uh, it makes it a very complicated uh, situation. And again, as, as Professor Cheers pointed out, uh, the differences in how Africans uh, were treated. Uh, this actually goes back to 2014, when the war broke out uh, initially in the East in 2014, it did not get a lot of international coverage, but African students who were studying came under attack from some of the pro-Russian militias uh, that arose in, uh, particularly in Luhas. Uh, Luhas, some were kidnapped. I was in Ukraine uh, in that period and worked with uh, some of the uh, individuals in the capital uh, to help uh, people get out of the region. Eventually, uh, Nigeria sent a train to Eastern, uh, Europe, uh, Eastern Ukraine uh, to bring out people because it had become so dangerous. But the world paid no attention at that point because these were basically African students and no one was really kind of uh, paying attention. Uh, but this, there's a long history there that, that needs to be uh, underscored. Dr. Cheers, uh, uh, you know, is Russia supporting bad government and authoritarianism in Africa as well, which kind of gives us some tentacles into the continent. I say that because we would like to say that every African country is well, well run. That's just not true. It's 54 of them. So there's some that are not. There's, there's corruption. They've, they've had experience in the last few months 
just a crisis of coups. Uh, I think there have been six in the last few months. So there, there is a, an issue there. And Russia, according to the UN, has been sending mercenaries into some of these countries and also committing human rights violations in others. Are they kind of meddling, you know, in the way that they meddled in politics over here just by on social media, but meddling on the ground with actual soldiers in, in Africa and making a mess of it and also therefore making more of an entanglement out of it and making it more difficult for these, these African countries to, to take a stand on this issue just on the merits. Absolutely, Mr. Blow. I mean, the reality is that Vladimir Putin is a opportunist. He is going to find any way that he can get his tentacles into any situation and cause chaos, right? And that's what we see him doing and have been doing throughout his reign as president or prime minister of Russia. That is his move. How can we sow dissension so that then we can capitalize off of the chaos? And he's continuing to do that. So that is going to just continue the way in which, and you can also look at some of his allies, right? Look at the power move that China has done on the African continent in the last 15 to 20 years. And we're seeing that that is all obviously very, very, very strategic. And as we're coming together, we're realizing that it is going to be in the benefit of Russia and China to continue to sow dissension, to continue to prop up mercenaries, to continue to um, cause chaos um, and fund chaos in a way that is going to destabilize regions, destabilize countries, so that when you have a power move as he did on February, uh, Vladimir Putin did on February 24th, where he launched his attacks into Ukraine, that he's going to continue to do that throughout the rest of this war. We don't know what's going to happen, but it is incredibly strategic. These notions that Putin is, quote unquote, a lunatic, or these things seem completely um, sporadic. They are not. They are power moves that he has been planning for a long time. And sowing this dissension on the African continent, as well as what he's done in the Middle East and in North Africa, he's going to continue to do to continue to destabilize countries that he feels are going to potentially be allies as he tries to destabilize the West. When it comes to some of these African countries and Russia, Ukraine, it's complicated. Dr. Money Cheers and Dr. La uh, Clarence Lusain. Thank you both for joining me tonight. Okay, that was uh, Charles Blow from Prime on the Black News Channel. Check that out, the Black News Channel's YouTube channel. That's from March 9th, 2022. The Russia-Ukraine conflict impacts African countries. The Russia-Ukraine conflict impacts African countries. Uh, check out this article from Al Jazeera. They mentioned the Berlin conference and we deal with this in, in the online class that I teach um, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa understand the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We deal with this also in from the civil war to the civil rights movement, the black power, 1865 to 1968, because this is in 1884 and 1885. Uh, this piece is from Al Jazeera, uh, an opinion piece, Berlin, Berlin, 1884, remembering the conference that divided Africa, remembering the conference that divided Africa. A hundred that this piece is from um November 15th, 2019. 135 years ago, European leaders sat around a horseshoe-shaped table to set the rules for Africa's colonization. This is by Patrick uh Gathara, uh communications consultant, writer, and award-winning political cartoonist based in Nairobi, Kenya. And this is a uh, depiction, a sketch of uh, the Berlin Conference. Um, on the afternoon of Saturday, November 15th, 1884, an international conference was opened by the chancellor of the newly created German Empire at his official residence in uh, Wilhelmstrasse in Berlin, in Berlin sat around a horseshoe shaped table in a room overlooking uh, the garden with, rep with, with representatives uh, sat, let me see, hold on. Okay, uh, sat around a horseshoe shaped table in a room overlooking 
uh, the garden with representatives from every European country apart from Switzerland, as well as those from the United States and the Ottoman Empire. The only clue as to the purpose of the November gathering of white men was hung on the wall, a large map of Africa, quote, drooping down like a question mark, end quote, as Nigerian historian uh, Professor Godfrey uh, uh, would comment, including a short break for Christmas and the New Year, the West African Conference of Berlin would last 104 days, ending on February 26, 1885. In the 135 years since, so it's um, 138 years now, uh, the conference has come to represent the late 19th century European scramble and partition of the continent of Africa. In the popular imagination, the delegates are hunched over a map armed with rulers and pencils sketching out natural national borders on the continent with no idea of what existed on the ground they were parceling out. Yet this is mistaken. The Berlin Conference did not begin the scramble. That was well underway. Neither did it partition the continent. Only one state, the short-lived horror that was the Congo Free State, came out of it, though, strictly speaking, it was not actually a creation of the conference. It did something much worse, though, with consequences that would reverberate across the years and be felt until today. It established the rules for the conquest and partition of Africa and the process legitimatizing the ideas of Africa as a playground for, out, for outsiders, its mineral wealth as a resource for the outside world, not for Africans, and its fate as a matter not left, not and its fate as a matter not to be left to Africans. So read the rest of this. So they, the, the, the geographical boundaries that exists in Africa today that separates one country from another country largely comes out of the Berlin Conference of 1884-1885. And these European nations who have been fighting, fighting and killing each other for hundreds of years over the mineral resources over the wealth of Africa, they create these new boundaries and they colonize Africa, different European nations taking different countries. And the geographical boundaries they draw around the natural resources that the respective, generally speaking, the natural resources that the respective European nations wanted. Okay, so read that from Al Jazeera. Um, Lastly, this is day 18 of the um, Russian invasion of Ukraine. We see that uh, a little more than 2.8 million people, a little more than 2.8 million people have uh, fled Ukraine also. And uh, we're going to get a quick update here from uh, NBC Nightly News. Let me go to this here. Uh, the day is day uh, 18 of the conflict, which began February 24th, 2021, February 24th, 2022. And we see the U.S. warns uh, China not to aid Russia. China is an um, ally of Russia. Uh, read the uh, updates from Washington Post. We'll talk about this some more on tomorrow's show. Uh, officials meet amid reports that Moscow sought weapons from Beijing, China. President Biden considers a trip to Europe to rally allies. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, I saw him speaking on MSNBC today, issued a direct warning to his Chinese counterpart Monday March 14th, about the potential consequences of any assistance that Beijing might provide Russia in its war with Ukraine, officials said following Moscow's recent request for military equipment and aid. 
So this this is not going the way Putin thought it was going to go. He didn't think this was going to go 18 days. Now he has to get aid from China. Okay, let's go to this clip here from uh, NBC Nightly News. Beware of Russia on its back foot. Apparently frustrated by its lack of progress on the battlefield, Russia is laying waste to Ukrainian cities and civilians from afar. Ukraine says this is an incoming Russian missile intercepted by Ukrainian air defenses falling and exploding on the streets of Kyiv. Nearby, Russia destroyed an apartment building. The strike just after 5 a.m. when most people were sleeping. There are no military targets here. This is just a civilian apartment building surrounded by other apartment buildings. And the only possible reason for attacking it is to kill civilians and terrorize the population just a few miles from the center of Kyiv. Serhi says intuition must have woken him. He was having a smoke when suddenly, in the slow time of extreme fear, he saw a flash and then the windows and doors came crashing in. Nina, a downstairs neighbor, was shaken but unhurt. In the aftermath, she was happy not to be alone. Do you have a mother, she asked. Her name happens to be Nina, too. Nina's three-room apartment is devastated. She was in bed asleep. And all of this fell on top of you? But it's amazing you're not hurt. Not even in a little broken glass, nothing. I had a big blanket on top of me, so all good, she says. Adding, she feels pity for Putin's mother, who is turning in her grave that she gave birth to such a nasty bastard. Outside lay the body of a man killed for being in his home. But even here, the spirit of resistance is unbroken. Meanwhile, Russia is taking its war further west, striking a military training base near the Polish border. While in the east, hitting Ukrainian homes in Kharkiv, Volnovaha, and Mariupol, where a humanitarian corridor today finally pierced the blockade, allowing hundreds of packed cars to leave. But too late for this pregnant woman in an iconic image after the bombing of a maternity hospital. She died. According to the Associated Press, when she was told her baby was dying, she said, kill me now. Attempts to save her were unsuccessful. And Richard, joining me from Kiev. Richard, today's negotiations between Russia and Ukraine ended with no breakthroughs, but what they're calling a technical pause. What do we read into that? So this is the fourth time that they have tried to have a peace settlement. But for the first time, they've agreed to continue the negotiations for a second day. So they ended now. They've had this technical pause. They'll resume again tomorrow. And both sides are hinting at possible progress. Now All right. OK, so that's from uh, NBC Nightly News from Monday, March 14th. 2022 also check out the um article from uh you check out the reporting from washington post and nbc news uh this piece from um nbcnews.com uh russia pounds ukraine as fourth round of talks are suspended for a day this is from march 14th uh 2022 okay so check that out All right, be sure to uh, register for the online classes uh, that I teach on the weekends. And our new class, uh, Great African Women in History, the Mothers of Civilization. Uh, this starts up Saturday, uh, March 19th. It's Saturday, March 19th and Saturday, March 26th. Uh, it's a four-hour online um, class. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it any time. Great African Women in History, the Mothers of Civilization will deal with over 100 different African women, African-American women from all different time periods, um, women of African descent uh, around the world from antiquity, from uh, African queens to uh, deities to uh, uh, pioneers in business. Where we talk about Annie Turnbull Malone, who was the mentor to Madam C.J. Walker. We talk about Dr. Patricia Bath. Offset, Angela Davis, uh, Valerie uh, Thomas, uh, Queen Charlotte Sophia, Yasanti Wah, 
We'll deal with uh, over 100 different African women, uh, with uh, uh, those in the civil rights movement, uh, politics, business, uh, abolitionists, all throughout history. So this class is on sale. This class is a $25. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can watch it anytime. This is a, I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, uh, video clips. As soon as you register, we have some bonus content that you can start watching also. And uh, after you register for the class, you have full access to it even after the course is over. So a year from now, you can go back and watch the entire uh, course. You can use this information with your children. I will say the content is PG-13, so you can register your family for the class. Um, and then uh, also on Saturday, so this one is, uh, this will be 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, okay? Uh, two consecutive Saturdays. And then uh, the 10 week online classes I teach uh, on Saturdays and Sundays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, Saturday, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. We do a thousands of years of history, and, uh, and we deal with what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. We deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors, also. Uh, and we do with the African presence in the Americas going back at least 51,700 uh, years ago here in the land we call the United States of America and at least 56,000 years ago in South America. These were the Khoisan who have the oldest DNA on the planet. So this class is on sale $60, uh, regularly $130. And we do this on Saturdays. On Sundays, it is from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865-1968. That's on sale sixty dollars as well. There's bonus content uh, with those. As soon as you start watching, you watch the classes we did this past weekend, and uh, even a year from now, if you want to go back and watch the entire class, you'll have access. You'll be able to do that. Uh, we have a bundle pack. You can register for both of these classes, both of the ten week classes, for only one hundred dollars. It's a two hundred sixty dollar value. If you've taken any of my online classes in the past, email me at ahn show at africanhistorynetwork.com ahn show at africanhistorynetwork.com you get 50 percent off on the uh on the bundle pack and we'll post a link here for the bundle as well but you can visit our website africanhistorynetwork.com uh we have the information there uh also okay and uh you can support the african history network as well dollar sign the ahn show through cash app dollar sign the ahn show through cash app also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the EHN show. So we have the link here and our official cash app account, dollar sign, the EHN show, S-H-O-W. When you go to it, it says Michael and shows my picture there. These other ones here are fake African History Network cash app accounts. I did not set those up and we have the um, PayPal button there also. This helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting. We're celebrating uh, our 12th year anniversary of me uh, hosting the African History Network show. Started out March 10th. 2010 um on the harambe radio network then i went to the blog talk radio network um as well and i've been on the empowerment radio network i've done nasty syndicated radio uh i've been here on 9 10 a.m superstation wfdf for six years okay the african history network show so it's been a crazy journey uh if you go to our website and click on listen to podcast where we have the information for the uh, radio show and when we broadcast because we're on monday through friday 11 p.m to midnight and sundays 9 p.m to 11 p.m eastern standard time you can click on listen to podcast and it has the uh it'll take you to our blog talk radio page where, and we have over a thousand uh audio podcasts of the shows also going back to 2010 okay so and then you can download the iheart radio app also download the iheart radio app uh, you can listen to the African History Network show. They're live on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF. You can listen to all the shows on 9, 10 a.m. Uh, also. And uh, on iHeartRadio, search for the African History Network show because we have a, a channel there. And it has they have about 300 of my uh, shows uh, podcasted there. Okay. That's at iHeartRadio. But we're on... Uh, 10 different audio podcast platforms, iTunes, iHeartRadio, CastBox, FM Player, TuneIn, um, and some other ones also. So check that out. Wherever you get your audio podcast from, search for the African History Network show. 
All right, we have to get out of here. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever.